When Alexander the Great conquered Babylon in 331 BCE, it maintained its position as the political center of ancient Mesopotamia. The power of this city actually expanded due to the fact that Alexander had envisaged it as the capital of his vast empire, which stretched from the coasts of the Adriatic Sea all the way to India. It was in the city of Babylon that Alexander the Great eventually died in 323 BCE in the palace of the Neo-Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II. His empire was divided among his generals and friends who subsequently fought each other in a series of bloody wars for supreme power. Babylon, being the center of one of the richest regions of the empire, of course became the target of many of the successors. More specifically, Babylon and Babylonia were violently fought over by Antigonos Monophthalmos and Seleucos. Contemporary sources give us an idea about the bloodshed and destruction caused by the conflict between these two men. Seleucus eventually triumphed, and Mesopotamia became part of the Seleucid Empire for the next 150 years. Under Seleucid rule, however, Babylon would lose its position as a political center of Mesopotamia. Seleucus, in fact, founded a city which would serve as the new capital of the land of the Tigris and the Euphrates, which is named the city of Seleucia on the Tigris. It was traditionally believed that this sealed the fate of Babylon and that it subsequently became a deserted city. Now there is proof that under Seleucus' successor, Antiochus I, there were indeed deportations of people from Babylon to Seleucia. But archaeology has shown that Babylon by no means became a ghost town. On the contrary, it remained, for example, a prominent intellectual center. Some of the biggest advancements in astronomy and astrology were in fact made by Babylonian scholars during the Hellenistic Age. Babylon also remained one of the most influential religious centers of Mesopotamia with its main sanctuary being the Isagila, the temple of the god Marduk. The worship of Marduk remained so important that it even demanded the respect of the Seleucid kings themselves. The previously mentioned successor of Seleucus, for example, Antiochus I, proudly recorded how he had restored the temple of Marduk to its former glory. And later on, the famous Antiochus III, also known as Antiochus the Great, personally participated in the Akitu festival, which was the New Year's festival of the city of Babylon, which revolved around the myth of how the god Marduk defeated the goddess of chaos, Tiamat. So the Seleucid kings, although they were probably very proud of their Greek Macedonian heritage, by no means disrespected the Babylonian culture. They even found it necessary to legitimize themselves towards the Babylonians in a Babylonian fashion. For example, the previously mentioned Antiochus the Great, during this Akitu festival, wore the robe of Nebuchadnezzar II, so he wanted to present himself as a reincarnation of this glorious Neo-Babylonian king. So to recapitulate, Babylon remained an important center during the Hellenistic Age with a large population. But who were these inhabitants exactly of Hellenistic Babylon? It is generally accepted that during the 3rd century BCE and the early 2nd century BCE, ethnically, the city remained largely unchanged. It was in fact not until the reign of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who ruled from 175 until 164 BCE, that we see a large influx of Greek and Macedonian settlers in Babylon. These colonists were probably deliberately moved to the city by this ruler as part of his larger Hellenization program within his empire. 
These settlers are referred to in the sources as politai, which can be translated as simply the citizens. They had their own institutions, but how they exactly functioned remains unclear, since information about the organization of this community is very scarce. This Greek Macedonian population was probably very proud of their identity and could express this through institutions such as the local theater or the gymnasium, which was a center of Greek Macedonian intellectual and physical education. One could even say that the Greek Macedonian inhabitants of Babylon contributed to the development of Greek culture. In fact, there was founded a Stoic school. Now these politai probably enjoyed privileges which the Babylonians had not. This did not mean, however, that the natives were politically marginalized. They were represented by a council which could communicate directly with the king and make their demands there. And since the Seleucid king respected Babylonian culture, he probably also respected at least some of the demands made by the Babylonians. Now the next question I wish to address is how were the relations between these settlers and the natives? There is proof that there were some conflicts, certainly at the end of the Seleucid period, when the Parthian danger was looming at the borders of Mesopotamia. But there was probably also much positive economic and social contact between these two groups. They might have been neighbors, since there is no proof that the Greek and Macedonian settlers had a separate neighborhood in which they lived independent from the rest of Babylon. And up until this day, no Greek temple has been unearthed in the city. This gave rise to an interesting hypothesis, which states that the Greek Macedonian colonists worshipped their gods in the same place as the Babylonians, namely the temple of Marduk, the Isagila. This would mean that the natives and colonists encounter each other frequently in a religious environment, which might have given rise to mutual understanding or even friendship. But I repeat that this is a hypothesis. It is also possible that arrangements were made that the settlers and natives worship their gods at different moments in the day in order to avoid contact between these two groups. Finally, there is one more important issue that I wish to address in this video. All this time we have been making a clear distinction between settlers and natives. But how correct is this? Were there really in Hellenistic Babylon two homogeneous groups, one of Greeks and Macedonians and the other of native Babylonians? It is very well possible that interracial marriage frequently occurred for social, economic or even emotional reasons. Some researchers claim that this was actually inevitable since there were far too few Greeks and Macedonians in Babylon to keep to themselves and that interracial marriage was actually necessary. There is also proof from elsewhere in Hellenistic Mesopotamia and the Seleucid Empire that there existed natives who adopted Greek culture and regarded themselves as Hellenic. These Hellenized natives could have had a fluid identity as immigrants do nowadays. They could have regarded themselves as part of the Greek world, but at the same time still identified themselves as belonging to the local culture. In any case, this Hellenic community continued to flourish after the Parthian king Mithridates I had conquered Babylon in 141 BCE. Many of the earlier Parthian monarchs, in fact, were well disposed towards Greek culture and treated their Greek Macedonian subjects favorably. And as Babylon became more and more a deserted town in the subsequent centuries, so did the Hellenic community of this city end up buried underneath the sands of time.